This is lecture 1.3, and today we are looking at the physical constitution, but also looking at um, kind of the passage and the ratification of the constitution. This will be one of your longer lectures. Uh, in fact, I think this will probably be the longest lecture that I do. So I would encourage you to um, stop and pause and, and um, you know, take some time with this one uh, because it, there's a lot of information. I would normally do this in a 45 minute period and I'm going to kind of work on this um, with the intent of you to stop and pause and make sure that you're paying attention to it. So, um, like I said, it is a little bit longer, but there's a lot of information that needs to be covered here. First, uh, looking at the different articles, um, this is something that you need to be familiar with. Uh, the three articles uh, at the very beginning of the Constitution when they were creating this document, Article 1 outlines the legislative branch, and that is significant simply because um, it shows that the legislative branch is the most important to the founding fathers, but also the legislative branch is the one that outlines the participation and the representation of the citizens. Um, so it is the first one, Article 1, uh, and that is something to definitely pay attention to, and it goes through all of the qualifications and all of the powers of the legislative branch. It would be a good idea for you to start to look at the different powers of the legislative branch, but we will be spending much more time on that uh, in a few weeks when we start Unit 2. Article 2 looks at the presidency, and the, it outlines the presidency. It's a pretty short article in the fact that the Founding Fathers wanted to loosely define uh, what the president could do because they were afraid of giving it too much power, uh, giving him or her eventually the too much power. And so the presidency is very loosely defined. And what that has actually led to, as we will see when we get into Unit 2, is increasing power to the president. Um, but Article 2 outlines the qualifications for the president and the vice president and also outlines some specific powers that the president can have. Article three talks about the judicial branch. It establishes the federal court system. Um, at the time of the passing of the articles or the ratification of uh, the constitution, I mean, we did not have a standing Supreme Court. That is something that happened as, as the country grew and, and expanded. Um, but the, the third article outlines what a federal judge should be uh, in terms of their good behavior and that they have a life tenure. Um, and that comes from all of the descriptions in Article 3. This one is also pretty short. Um, most of the language in the Constitution actually comes from Article 1. It's the most clearly defined branch of government. So what you have is a system of separation of powers and checks and balances created by um, these three branches. There are certain things that the legislative branch can do that the judicial branch cannot. Um, on the next slide, and these three have to work together in order to create policy or to implement policy. On the next slide, um, what I have is a list of different powers and things that can um, that are equated to a specific branch. My suggestion would be now that the, the list is up is to pause this video and go through and do the best that you can to determine which branch um, each of these powers goes to. So if you're, you know, if, if you have this list here, I would just number it one to whatever this is, 10 or 11, and uh, go through and say, may veto bills. This is what I think they can do. So I would encourage you to hit pause and do that on your own and then pick up uh, with me going through each of these so that you know what the answers are. The answers are may veto bills. That goes to the executive branch. May override the president's veto that goes to the legislative branch, may impeach and remove the president from office, that goes to the legislative branch, may declare a law unconstitutional, that is the judicial branch. One thing that you will find is that was not something that was originally in the Constitution that has been created over time. Set salaries for federal judges, that is the um, legislative branch appoints federal judges, that is the executive branch, approves federal judges is going to be the legislative branch, but just simply appointing the federal judge that comes from the executive branch. Recommends legislation, that is the executive branch. May refuse to ratify a treaty, 
that comes from the Senate and a very uh, important one in American history would be coming from the Treaty of Versailles uh, to end World War I. May ratify constitutional amendments that comes from the legislative branch. May grant pardons uh, that comes from the executive branch. And that one I think is interesting because that's a check that the executive has over the, the judicial branch. Uh, and that if a judge finds somebody guilty, the president just simply says you're pardoned and your sentence, your sentence is over, um, your charge is, is complete and it's done, it's wiped clean. Uh, one of the most famous pardons was the pardon of Richard Nixon. Um, so there were no criminal charges. There was no additional investigation into Nixon and his actions during Watergate. The, the um, investigation, the situation was just done. The last one is may rule executive orders on constitutional. That again is the judicial branch. So just a kind of good understanding right now, very basic, uh, good practice for you to look at and see what checks and balances and specifically what powers belong to each. Uh, we will go into these a little bit more. If you struggled with this list right now, it's not a big deal. Uh, we will be talking about these a lot more as we get into unit two. Article four of the constitution, I'm not going to necessarily go into a lot on uh, because the full faith and credit clause is something that will come up in your next lecture. But article four talks about the relationship between the states. The one thing that I do think is interesting, I'll, I'll spend some time on this, is the extradition piece of uh, the state. So if, you, if a crime is committed within a state, the person has to be tried for, uh, in the state in which the crime was committed. So in terms of extradition, it's very, it's kind of interesting living in Northern Kentucky because let's say something were to happen with it. if you went into Ohio, um, that charge is going to be in Ohio. You have to be returned to Ohio for to, to face the judge or, or go on trial. Um, that does not come, that, that does not happen. That, that trial does not happen in Kentucky. Um, there was a story, uh, I think it was about 10 or 15 years ago of an NFL uh, player, I think he played for the New Orleans Saints, um, who when he would go on all of these these trips to away games, uh, they'd go to Los Angeles, they'd go to Chicago, they'd go to Florida, you know, they'd go to Washington, D.C., um, and he had committed sexual assault in just about all eight of those cities. Um, and what had to happen is he had to go to each individual city and face the judge uh, and then ultimately was was charged in each of those cities. So he would face, you know, eight to 10 years in prison in California. And then when that crime was served, he would go to Colorado and face his eight to 10 years in Colorado. Um, so extradition is uh, just dealing with, um, you know, if a crime is committed in one state, the states are required to return them um, to the state in which the crime was committed. Also, privileges and immunities, you cannot treat citizens of another state in a discriminatory manner, um, except if you're from Ohio. Um, that, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. Um, <laughs> but if you know, if you go into Kentucky that, and you're from Ohio, they can't say, well, you're from Ohio. We're not going to let you in this building or whatever. Um, there, there has to be some, some equal treatment between the citizens of each state. Article four outlines the formal amendment process. Um, this is something, or our, excuse, excuse me, article five outlines the formal amendment process. Um, this is something that I think looks very complicated, but um, in order to break it down, uh, I'm only gonna go over really two of these and you truly only have to know about one of these. So I'm not gonna go over the last two. You can know those for, um, your own purposes if you want to, but in order to understand the formal amendment process, this is physically how the constitution changes. We are talking about the 27 times that an amendment was added to the constitution. This is how it can get done. The most important way is to understand that the first step starts in this upper left box. It is proposed by Congress by a two thirds vote of both houses. Um, I always get the question, do we have to know that it's two thirds vote? Not necessarily. You do have to know that it is a much more than a majority in both houses of Congress. So both the House and the Senate have to approve this at a two thirds level. 
Um, it is not a majority. AP will mark it wrong. If on an essay you say that uh, an amendment is a majority of both houses of Congress. So just make sure that you know that it is above a majority. It is two thirds of both houses of Congress. And then it is three fourths of the state. So right now, 38 states, state legislatures have to approve the uh, amendment that's added to the constitution. This here, the top left corner to the top right corner both of those steps have to take place in order for an amendment to be ratified. If 38 states do not ratify it, the, the amendment will not be added to the Constitution. So you can see how the change from the Articles of Confederation, where 50 states would have had to have agreed, you're now putting a federal and a state check on the amendment process. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this process here, the top left corner to the top right corner, that is how 26 of the 27 amendments were added to the Constitution. So if you're going to know a way of, of that the amendments were added, this is the one right here. I would definitely pay attention to that. The second one was the proposed at a national convention called by Congress when requested by three fourths of the state legislatures. So if you see here, you see federal power and state power coming uh, coming together to create an amendment to the Constitution. In this case, you have states requesting something, requesting a convention, and then states ratifying. So in this way, it is simply the states that are requesting uh, an amendment to the Constitution, almost taking out the, um, the power of Congress in that sense. Um, you do have a national convention, so there's some sort of national power, but it's, it's coming from an initiation by the states. Um, this method here, the bottom left corner to the top right corner was done one time. And I, I always, every year, I should know this every year, I get this wrong. Uh, it was either the 18th amendment or the 21st amendment. So it had to do with alcohol, I believe. Um, it was either 18, 19. So it was either 18 with the 20, with alcohol being pro prohibited, uh, the 21st with overturning the 18th, or it was the 19th amendment with women's rights to vote. It's one of those three. Uh, you don't have to know that, um, but that is uh, that is the second way that the amendment has been ratified. So again, the only two ways that this process has ever been done is the top left corner to the top right corner, the bottom left corner to the top right corner. The other two are possible, but I'm not going to go over those since they've never been done. And that is uh, the top left to the bottom right and the top or the bottom left to the bottom right. Um, so these are never done, but the top one is the most important. If you have questions on that, be sure to ask, because that is something that kids tend to, uh, to, to have questions about. These are just kind of fun. Um, if you want to take a minute and read these, I'll let you. You can stop and read it on your own, but these are just some amendments that have failed over time. You also have, I'm actually going to skip this. I don't want to go over this. Uh, no, I will go over this. Um, no, I won't. I lied. Sorry. Article six of the constitution, uh, outlines the supremacy clause. And that is simply what just states that the state and federal government or state and federal government, excuse me, state and local government have to defer to the federal government in terms of their laws. That one is going to be discussed in a later PowerPoint. So I won't cover that one too much either. Article seven talks about the ratification of the um, constitution. And a key thing to understand is, uh, and one of the important things about the ratification is the division that was created as a result of the creation of the constitution. You had two groups of people, the anti-federalists and the, fed excuse me, the federalists. The, the easiest way for me to tell you to remember this is the anti-federalists were the people that were anti-federal government. They believed in more state power. They wanted to see a government that was similar to the Articles of Confederation. The federalists were for the federal government. So anti-federalists are against the federal government. The federalists are for the federal government. Um, the, the part here that I want you to pay attention to is not necessarily the backgrounds, but definitely paying attention to the government 
preferred part. Uh, and you do need to understand those differences because what you will see is this is the foundation for division in our political parties. Um, you know, whether you want a strong state government or a weaker state government and strong national government, um, that is essentially what we are talking about today in many cases. So um, do take a minute to, to write those down. Um, and this is where the debate really came about was afterwards. The Federalists were kind of, and here's another example of different um, examples here of um, different beliefs of the two sides. And, and again, take the time to write these down. Uh, the Federalists were definitely all about the Constitution. They were the ones that were pushing it. Um, the Anti-Federalists were looking for a way to uh, kind of guarantee that the state's rights were going to be upheld. And um, the only way that the Anti-Federalists would really go for the article or the uh, adoption of the Constitution was if a Bill of Rights was put into place. Um, so besides these things that they, they kind of had in these, this T-chart here, um, they wanted to make sure that their rights were going to be protected. Um, the Federalists didn't really think that was important. Uh, people like Alexander Hamilton wrote that, in fact, they felt that the, the Constitution already protected those, but the Anti-Federalists wanted to make sure that that was there. So that is why we have a Bill of Rights, because that was, was able to kind of get the Constitution moving forward and got the Anti-Federalists on board. Once the Constitutional Convention was over, the Federalists started to, and especially Hamilton, Madison, and John Jay, um, write the Federalist Papers. And these were just essays that were posted and published to try and encourage the adoption of the Constitution. And you're going to be required to read three or four of these, four of these uh, throughout the course of the year. Um, and you're going to have to know those, one of those being Federalist 10 that you're going to read uh, in, in upcoming assignment and have a discussion about in class, uh, Federalist 51, Federalist 70, and Federalist 78. Those are all going to be the ones that you have to read uh, because they encourage the adoption of the, the Constitution um, and kind of outline some of the things that we look for when we talk about uh, whether it be political parties or the presidency or the judicial branch. So um, that will be something that you want to pay attention to because those were essays that were written to encourage the states to adopt the Constitution um, right after the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. Um, And if you want to, you can write these down on your own. Um, but basically, it's just what I said about the Federalist Papers. Uh, and if you've, those of you that have seen Hamilton uh, on Disney Plus, you're probably very familiar with uh, one piece of that that play is about this. So um, this is a very long lecture, very a lot of details. I would highly encourage you again to go back if you need to um, and ask questions if if you have any. Uh, because there is a lot of information in here. Um, so hopefully you were able to kind of pause and, and take those notes down and reflect uh, on the things that you need. And, and please let me know if you have any uh, questions or anything like that about these topics.